set, ready or not. Yes. We're live. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome, welcome everybody. We are live coming to you from Phoenix, Arizona and Atlanta, Georgia, right? Yes, yes. Beautiful Atlanta, Georgia. And for those of you who, uh, oh, oh, I got a commercial running. See, this is, you've always loved to surprise me. Uh, Those of you who are just joining the chat, thank you so much for being here. It looks like we've got Miriam and Catherine. Paul is in here. Paul is uh, Johnny on the spot. He's helping me out, keep track of all the comments and questions so that when we do Q&A in the end, uh, that we've been able to track all of those. But how's, how's everybody doing this morning? (laughs) <laughs> or afternoon or evening, feel free to share in the comments where you're coming to us from. Uh, but just as a point of introductions, I am so thrilled to have with me here today, uh, a new friend, a new connection, and somebody who's a crazy talented educator in the space of food photography, product photography, especially flat lay photography. We've got Kimberly Murray with me here today. How's it going, Kimberly? It's going great. And thank you for having me, Joni. I'm excited to, to chat with you today. Absolutely. This is, this is a treat for me um, because I, well, I love your Instagram. You, you, you bring it on Instagram. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I think that's where we first connected. Somebody had recommended you and said, Kimberly is totally killing it over there. It's got some great resources, great education. Um, Because I think that's what's really fun, especially for me. I mean, there's tons of, you know, super talented photographers out there, plenty of them here with us live right now. Um, But it's always so exciting to see other people who are also teaching what we're doing. So um, I'm excited to dig into that, excited to dig into how you got into photography, your area of expertise, and, and a photo that really caught my eye on your portfolio, but, um, oh, it looks like Fanette is here. You know, Fanette. Hey, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, real quick, just to make yeah. sure the comment section is working. I want everybody to share with me, uh, what is the last thing that you photographed? So whether that be food or products or your kids, the last thing you photographed, if you can share that with us in the comment section, that's always fun to hear. What was the last thing you photographed, Kimberly? Actually, it was a beautiful interior. So I also do interior photography. And so it was this um, kind of really light interior space that was all neutral tones with some black accents and just a lot of different textures going on. And so that was my last. Very fun. Was that so where was that? Was that a specific place? It was here in Atlanta. So I work with this interior design duo and they had a space they needed photographed and so it was a residential space here in Atlanta. Oh that's awesome that's beautiful when it's so fun too you know because I'm sure you can you know share more about why this is because I mean looking at your work it makes sense I think that you like interiors in terms of like the angles and the clean lines. Yes, yes. <laughs> like it's speaking my language right now. Yeah, exactly. There's something almost architectural about the way that you almost do your product photography. So I feel like that it's a very kindred skill set. Yes. Uh, oh, let's see. Oh, Francesca photographed a plant in the garden. Always mm-hmm. fun, especially this time of year. Kim Morris did a whiskey sour. Okay. Kim, way to rock the drinks. Drinks are tricky stuff. Yes. Do you do drinks much? Kimberly? Not much. I want to do more, but not much. Yeah. 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 They're, they, I always say they're like an entirely different discipline <laughs> in comparison to food photography. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, Fanette is, Fanette agrees that your architectural work is amazing. Uh, thanks, Fanette. Um, Mike C4 Lowry said he photographed an active two-year-old. <laughs> I'm sure that was a challenge. <laughs> We're going to get into your uh, background, too, of doing family (laughs) photography, which you know, you probably have all the tricks of chasing down the (laughs) two-year-olds. Let's see. We've got, oh, Elaine photographed a ginormous cake. Finette did a gin and tonic and knees bees. Oh, Paul did, uh, oh, a South African barbecue. Sounds delicious. It does. (laughs) 
Uh, I love it. Oh, and LVS Custom Creations made some mini key lime pies and took a flat lay photo. Well, oh, cool. LVS Custom Creations sounds like you're in the right place this morning. Uh, so definitely feel free to keep sharing in the comments and connect with each other. If there's somebody else in the comment section uh, who's created something that you're excited about, uh, you want to connect with, feel free to do that. It's a community space. So with that, let's go ahead and jump in. Let me get my notes here because I definitely want to stay on track because okay. I get distracted and go in the wrong direction. <laughs> um, so Kimberly, you do a variety of different kinds of photography, but you've also definitely you know, focused your work over the years. Um, but I want to kind of start before we dig into kind of the experience of finding that signature style and really focusing on the kind of work that speaks to you. Um, I want to kind of go in the way back machine and talk about where did your photography journey start? What was the, that impetus that inspired you to first pick up that camera? Okay. So I think that it was around 2009 and I was looking for a wedding photographer and, you know, just kind of going on all these different sites and falling in love with their work and falling in love with I think just the way that they were able to tell the seamless story through the portraits and the detail shots and kind of getting ready. And then of course, like, you know, the usual ceremony reception thing. And I was like, I want to do that. This seems so interesting, so exciting and was talking about it to my husband a lot. And then he bought my first camera as a wedding gift, like literally a day before we left for our honeymoon. No way. Yes. What was that first camera? It was a Canon Rebel. And very so nice. like the very, you know, First oh, yeah. level Canon, you know, series DSLR. And uh, so yeah, Canon Rebel kit lens, took it on our honeymoon. We went to the Turks and Caicos and, you know, I didn't know what I was doing at all. I didn't know that I was supposed to like press the button halfway to autofocus. So I was taking these pictures. I'm like, it's out of focus. I don't know what's going on. It's too <laughs> dark. And I'm just like turning knobs and turning knobs. And finally was just like, let me just kind of turn this dial on the lens to try to focus it. And so it was a little bit of a frustrating experience there. You know, this, the first day I opened up the camera was when we were on the honeymoon and just trying to figure out my way and, you know, lucked upon a couple of like good shots yeah. and then decided when I get back, I'm really going to like learn this camera and figure out, you know, kind of find my way. Yeah. So yeah. talk about trial by fire. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely. But, but clearly, you know, there's that, like, I, I feel like probably so many people who are also with us on the call know that experience of like that frustration, but like, there's something inside you that wants you to keep moving forward. You're like, yes. I'm not going to let this beat me. Exactly. Exactly. And I think it was when I was on the honeymoon, it was one shot, we were in a hot air balloon and I kind of like tilted the camera up and got this angle that I thought was cool and it was in focus. And so I think that's the moment that I was like, yes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> do this. I'm a photographer. Yeah. And then, you know, got back and, and started just experimenting with different types of photography and, and started out shooting, you know, kind of what was accessible to me. And then I followed a few trends and then like finally settled into what just naturally felt right for me and what I just genuinely enjoyed doing. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as like that whole process, cause yeah. I mean, obviously you go from this being a hobbyist, kind of somebody who's just enjoying this kind of having these sites set on the wedding. So did you do wedding photography? I did for a hot second. So I second shot actually for my wedding photographer, she was, you know, gracious enough to allow me to second shoot with her because I was like, oh, I'm really interested. And so did that a few times. I solo shot one wedding and yeah, it's not my ministry. So <laughs> <laughs> do you, what, do you know specifically, I mean, cause clearly, you know, I, we've had this conversation yeah. in other, um, live streams and conversations with other folks here on the channel that, you know, wedding photography is really hard and it's, there are so many challenges to it, but like for you specifically, how did you know that that wasn't where you were meant to be? You know, when it was, the fact that there are only certain parts of the day that I really enjoyed. So I was like, I love the getting ready period because you can take a lot of candid shots, get a lot of great detail shots, love the bride and groom portraits, but everything else, which is, you know, the bulk of the day, <laughs> yeah. was like snooze fest because it just seems so routine. Like, yes, there are some differences across weddings in terms of, you know, interesting things that might take place during the ceremony or reception, but 
otherwise, most ceremonies kind of follow the same kind of format. Most receptions follow the same format. And it just wasn't interesting enough for me. I was like, yeah, I like the first two hours of the day after that. Not so much. And it's a good, like, weddings are like 10, 12 hour days. So yeah. It's a beast, man. It that's, is. That's, it I'd is. say that's young people's work too. <laughs> Most definitely. <laughs> it's like my back was hurting by the end of the day. I'm like trying to take ta- Tylenol, Advil, whatever. So yeah. yes, yes. And you have to love it, I think, to really hang in there, do it well and, and continue to progress. Yeah. And I did so not, did not so that was kind of that first mile marker though, of kind of yeah. gauging your internal, you know, feeling and going, okay, this isn't, this isn't the direction for me. So once you kind of decide, okay, it's not wedding photography, what was sort of the next area that you focused on in photography? Yes. So actually I started out with children and families. Okay. And so that was what was most successful is because I had a young nephew. I'm like, oh, he's really cute. Let me just practice on him. And kind of learn how to, you know, when I learned how to blur the background, that's when I thought that, you know, I'm the cat's meow right now. (laughs) And so I started with that. And my sister was actually connected to a mom group here in Atlanta. And so I was able to book clients like my first family client or child and family clients through just this mom group and did that for a while and really enjoyed portrait work in some respects, but not really the, the posed family portraits, like I love the candid moments when the kids are kind of running around and just kind of being themselves. And those weren't necessarily the images that the clients most love. Like, no, we want everyone looking at the camera and smiling and like, oh, that's the picture you chose. Like, I love this one. (laughs) And so there was that period. And then around that time was when newborn photography was a really big thing and kind of the pose babies in the basket and the cute little, you know, frog yeah. pose. Yeah, that whole Did thing. Did you do the thing where you like prop them up and you do the two shot composite? You know, I tried, it's so funny because I really wanted to be a newborn photographer. So I flew across the country to California, spent all this money on this one-on-one with his like, you know, big newborn photographer and got there and was terrified. Like she wanted to, you know, show me hands-on posing yeah. And I was like, oh, no, no, I don't actually want to touch the baby. I'm like, I don't want to break the baby. <laughs> I'm not touching this baby. baby. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm just going to watch you, you. Had you had your kids at that point? I had not. So yeah. I had never, you know, swaddled a baby, really held a baby because my nephew, you know, I didn't, I wasn't here when he was born to like go through that initial very like newborn period. And so, yeah, I was just like, <laughs> I don't want to touch the baby. I'm just okay. going to watch <laughs> You put it in a basket, I'll photograph right, it. Exactly. <laughs> and she did that whole, you know, two shot composite. And so I yeah. could observe how that was done, but, you know, I was just too nervous to actually get in there, even though she was trying to encourage me like, no, like this is kind of why you flew across the country to learn how to do this. Yeah. And I was like, no, no. Yeah. And then I got back home and I had a couple of newborn sessions, but I think that it was a little just anxiety provoking for me without having any kids and feeling like, babies are fragile. I don't want anything to happen. And so mm-hmm. that was a short lived, you know, period, the newborn yeah. period that's was good. a little short lived. A little dabbling in all the different ponds. Like, exactly. let's this guy on. Oh, okay. That doesn't quite work. <laughs> so, so what came next then? You did the family portraits for a while. It sounds yeah. like. I did. So I did the family portraits for a while. I dabbled in kind of blogger, influencer photography. So, you know, people who do like the outfit of the day at the time, which I Mm -hmm. guess people still do that. So I did that for a little while, but I think the entire time I knew that I really wanted to photograph things and not so much people. And I just kind of didn't know how to get there. And then I think in 2014 is when things started to kind of all come together for me. Okay. Yes, and so 2014, there was a DIY blogger named Brittany Melha. She runs a blog called Paper and Stitch. And so she was moving to Atlanta and I saw on Instagram, she put out a call for a photographer and I was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to apply. Like, I don't know her, she didn't know me. I don't really engage with her content because it's kind of just found her. And we ended up working together and she did all the styling and you know, just kind of had these really great ideas about you know DIY things to make. Mm-hmm. And I was the photographer for like a good year, maybe. Wow. And it was just, it felt so energizing. I loved every minute of it. She had a very kind of bright style and love, you know, natural light. And, and it was just like, oh my goodness, this is, this is what I love doing. And I eventually decided I'm not going to photograph people anymore. I'm just going to find 
a space in this kind of still life kind of realm and, mm -hmm. and make it work. That's a crazy moment though, where, yeah, you've been doing kind of this one thing that maybe has yeah. kind of defined your work and now to right. sort of run in a different direction. Was that, was that a hard switch to make? It was, it was a hard switch, you know, internally because you wonder, you know, can I make money making this switch? Because everyone always needs portraits, you know, like people love taking pictures of their family, but I'm like, I don't know what else I can do. I'm working with this one DIY blogger, but I don't know what else there is out there. I know that I love it, but I don't know how I'm supposed to make money other than working with this one person, you know? Yeah. But I think that ultimately I was like, I need to stay true to myself. I still would take, you know, portrait work, but then I started to show it less and kind of segue from there. Yeah. yeah. So what, so then how did you make that leap then to doing what you do now how did because I mean I feel like you're like looking at your work and looking at your portfolio it's all about like that product the interiors that sort of um kind of I mean definitely in line with kind of what you're saying where your heart was really being right. pulled how like how did that work how did you make that switch yes so it, it was interesting because I think that there were kind of parallel things lining up and, you know, it's like everything was in alignment, <laughs> so to speak, because around that time also, which was like 2014, 15 period, I started seeing on Instagram also just these kind of really pretty feminine desktop images popping up. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what this is. You know, it's kind of styled stock photography. Mm -hmm. like, this is interesting. Let me kind of explore and kind of go down the rabbit hole and eventually you know, happened upon the person who was really creating those, those images, which is a woman named Shay Cochran. And at the time she had the SC stock shop and, you know, I was kind of browsing on that shop and saw that she was making good money. Well, I'm assuming making good money because the images were selling at a nice price and people seemed to really be loving them and, and, and purchasing them. And I was like, oh, this is a thing. You know, I didn't know that this is a thing and it seems like something I could do because before that, the only thing I knew about kind of still life photography or flat lays was magazine work, mm. you know, or these other kind of big name photographers. I'm like, okay, it seems like you need to have training in photography. This isn't, you know, a field for, you know, self-taught photographers. But when I saw Shay's work on yeah. Instagram and that it was selling and people seemed to love this style of stock photography, I was like, oh, like maybe I can do that too. Well, and you had mentioned her in kind of the prep call that we did for yes. this. And so of course I went and like taste it out and for sure, like I went to her website, looked at all our right. photography. I'm like, oh, this has been like the landing page for like half the influencers and, you know, right. people in digital marketing and yeah. <laughs> like, oh, yes. she, she has, she really created a brand and, yeah. and, a, and a concept. And so that really resonated with you then, huh? It did. It did. Yeah. Yes. But, I but in yeah. terms of that style because you you haven't necessarily kept with that though I mean no. what what about that worked and what about that didn't work for you so I I tried that style in the beginning and I didn't do it well because <laughs> it's like the roses like draped yeah. over the keyboard and the little coffee and all the cute little tchotchkes and lots of pinks yeah. white light and airy sort of thing yes yes I'm like hoping I'm not gonna have a coughing fit right now <laughs> oh you're <laughs> good, you're good. <laughs> so yes yeah, so and in, initially I tried that I tried that very thing because I was looking at what she was designing and creating and what was selling and I was like okay so the people want they want pink they want flowers they want feminine items on this desk I'm going to do that too mm -hmm. and I tried it you know mm -hmm. and I tried to mimic even the layout and you know, they, they, they kind of looked a hot mess. My images in comparison, I was like, this looks nothing like her work. I'm doing kind of the same thing. I don't know where the disconnect is, you know? Yeah. yeah and you're I, like, I feel like I'm perfectly, cause I've done that. You know, I think we've all done that, right? Like you look at this and you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to like right. perfectly put everything and it just yes. missing something. <laughs> right. Right. It's like that it factor and you don't know what it is. Yeah. I think for me, it's like, that was genuinely her style. Yeah. You know, and I think she might have like some sort of family connection, I think to plurals too. And so for me, I'm like, I'm not even like super girly in that way. And that's not naturally, naturally what I'm drawn to like those style of objects. 
And so that's why it didn't work for me because it wasn't even true to who I am or what I naturally would purchase, you know, just on my own, if not for an image. Yeah. 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 No. And so, I mean, is that hard then at that point to, I mean, how did you, I guess I feel like sometimes like we get wrapped up in thinking, I don't know if you feel like this way too, but sometimes you get wrapped up in thinking like, this is the way it's supposed to be done. And if I try to go off in this other direction, right. And have that internal dialogue. Was that your experience too? Right. No, totally. It was, it was <laughs> definitely. <laughs> and, you know, there came a point where I just had to really step back and, and it's, and it's a hard point. I'm not saying that it was overnight and that one day I woke up. I think when I had to be honest with myself, I knew that what I was creating and was trying to put out there was missing the mark. I knew that it wasn't really good in terms of my own standards and, you know, let alone maybe other people's standards. So I was like, okay, I need to take a step back. Mm -hmm. This isn't going to work for me. And also, you know, it gets really draining trying to keep up a persona that is not true to who you are. You know, it's like you can fake the funk and pretend to be someone for a short time, but thinking about having to keep that up long term, like that's exhausting and it's yeah. difficult and it's stressful. And I was like, okay, I can't start down this path because I'm not going to be able to keep it up and continue to do it well and come up with new ideas and just kind of be at peace, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I had to say, let me start creating without thinking about whether that image or that style is going to sell. Like, let me just figure out what it is I like, regardless mm. of whether people will want to purchase it. So a lot of creating for yourself then, was that a part of that process? Yes. Yes. Creating for myself for sure. And I remember that I had at one point a lot of black and gold, you know, just things around my house, like belt, handbag, you know, whatever. So it's like, okay, I'm going to just pull all of these black and gold items together and, you know, just experiment and create a flat lay, which was totally, I felt opposite what was being put out there in terms of like, oh, bright and colorful and girly. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go the black and gold route mm -hmm. and created this image, put it on Instagram and it got a lot of likes and like positive feedback. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of a confidence booster for me to like, okay, maybe people do like what my genuine style perhaps is. And let me just keep exploring and, and figuring it out and just experimenting kind of on my own. I think that's such a great tip though, you know, cause I think it is so hard to yeah. kind of like connect with and figure out what that style is, you know, right. especially when we're bombarded with a sea of online content and other people's styles. But I love that idea of like going around your house and like looking at your own wardrobe and looking at your own decor and your right. own personal life choices. I mean, I think that's such a smart move that, uh, <laughs> Probably, probably some of the folks here, you know, myself included, can go, oh, I right. do like that color. <laughs> yes. And then, and it's totally what worked for me, right? Because I'm thinking about my home and I'm like, oh, I love really bright spaces. I love clean lines. I like modern furniture. And then yes, the colors and textures and what have you. So that's mm -hmm. what helped to influence just the types of items that I would include in my in my image. And then there was like a separate thing that actually goes back to interiors that influenced the way I decided to think about how to style an image. Yeah. And so for me, you know, early on, I mentioned, I tried to just mimic the placement of items based on kind of what I was seeing, you know, out there in the world, essentially mm -hmm. on Instagram, pretty much or Pinterest. Yeah. And then, you know, I was like, well, let me figure out what makes an image interesting and how do I go about placing items in a space, right? Hmm. And so back in the day, this was before I even thought about photography, I took courses in interior design at FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. Yeah. And I wanted to be an interior designer at one point and that wasn't, it, it didn't turn out to be what I ended up doing clearly. <laughs> but you but, can see the connection there. Yes. There's, there's definitely something there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and photograph interiors now. Yeah. But at the time, you know, I was buying a lot of interior magazines like House Beautiful and, you know, all the others, Architectural Digest, El Decor, whatever, and just kind of buying these magazines and pouring through them. And then thinking about when I was photographing interiors, like what makes a space really beautiful to me? It's like, okay, well, one, it's like the flooring and intentional selection of flooring because maybe you're choosing something because it's going to be in the kitchen. Like you're not going to put a white rug in the kitchen because it's going to have spills. 
or maybe you're not going to put a certain you know type of, of rug or carpet or whatever in a space because it gets a lot of foot traffic so thinking about that and thinking about the fact that when you bring items in once you've figured out everything that you want in your space maybe you're going to first put the statement piece in or the large sofa and then you're going to build around that and build on top of that and maybe add accent pillows now and the details and just thinking about how interior designers put together a space helped me think about, okay, how I can approach flat lay photography and putting together this image too. Oh, that's, that is awesome. Cause it, the, it is always so interesting too. You know, I think that like you, you mentioned, you know, it's so important, I think to step away from, you know, the tunnel yeah. vision of this uh, industry that we're in right. and, and go borrow. Cause there are so many other design avenues and yeah. so many other genres of visual creating a visual right. statement that you know oh the things you can pull from there i love yes. that and yes even cool. even going to museums right and you're looking at the artwork and some artwork well most artwork for me anyway never looks flat even though it's you know a flat item typically it's like the way that the artist is building the paint on top of each other and maybe mm -hmm. you see the under layers kind of peeking through or there's texture and you just want to reach out and touch it there's so much that you can learn from from other realms that are not photography. Yeah. So it sounds like what you what you're suggesting and I wholeheartedly support is really being observant and yeah. just soaking soaking up things and taking that time to intentionally kind of deconstruct things to understand it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I love it. So um in terms of your style though, and I mean, for sure, anybody who's here right now with us live, or if you're watching the um, watching the replay afterward, definitely go check out Kimberly's Instagram. You'll get a good flavor and a good sense of, um, of her style and what she does. I think it's very cohesive and very strong. I've got it linked down in the description box below so you can go um, check it out. But you know, after all these years of evolving and experimenting and trying different things and really intentionally crafting that style um how would how would you define your style what would you say are some of the hallmarks of of what speaks to you i think that across all of the different types of photography i think that my imagery is clean meaning i don't like have a lot of filters i don't have any filters i just kind of like an image to look how it would look out of the camera with a pop you know mm -hmm. and so clean bright i tend towards the minimalist style of things and so i think those are of three descriptors yeah no i'd say that's that and and your yeah your use of line is just i mean line is such an important thing in, in a composition and um right. you've got some great resources too for those who haven't checked out kimberly's blog um some outstanding resources and educational pieces so uh, that's also linked down below so go grab that um but i was of course perusing your portfolio because i'm you know nosy like that okay let's <laughs> go see, see what else she's got going on over there and there i mean so many phenomenal images that definitely got some creative juices going in my mind but there was one shot in particular um of some eggs with these okay. beautiful teal shoes can you tell me like why you shot that what does that mean i need to know about the eggs and the shoes okay <laughs> awesome <laughs> and so that image i actually shot for a tether tools how i got the shot guide oh cool yeah, yeah it's and it was so interesting how it came about so i was talking like i was in collaborate con communication with their pr and marketing director this was back in 2017. okay and i had pitched Tether Tools to sponsor me for my first speaking engagement at a photography conference. So I was teaching flat lay photography for the first time at a conference and they offered, you know, a modest honorarium, but they recommended like, oh, you can also seek out a sponsor, mm. you know, if you want to have more support around your lodging, et cetera. And so I thought, okay, who can I pitch? You know, what would make sense for flat lay photography? Yeah. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to pitch Tether Tools even though I had, you know, very small following on Instagram, like no one knows me, but I'm going to pitch Tether Tools. So like, hey, can you give me some money <laughs> so yeah. I can, you know, to support my travel to this conference? And, you know, we were going back and forth. They didn't end up sponsoring me for that, you know, conference. But then two months after I pitched them, the PR marketing manager, she contacted me and said, hey, 
We're doing a women's only edition of our How I Got the Shot Guide. We plan to, you know, release it on March, you know, 2018 on the International Women's Day. And, you know, we'd love for you to be, you know, included. Are you interested? Yeah. And I was, you know, I had looked at some of their previous guides and there were like legit big time photographers who are part of this guide. So I was nervous and thinking, one, why me? <laughs> like, why are you asking me if I want to do this? And I was scared. But I was like, I tend to take on opportunities even when I'm scared That's because, good. you know, it's like, I'm going to shake my way through it, <laughs> but I'm going to do it. And so I said yes, and then started racking my brain for, okay, what can I create that's interesting enough that doesn't seem like too elementary, but that also kind of puts me in the realm that I want to be known for. So I knew that I wanted to do something that was a still life, product photography, food photography, kind of tried to meld the two. Mm -hmm. I had these shoes, those, you know, teal shoes. Yeah. And that were too small. Like I bought these shoes because I oh. love the color. <laughs> you just already, oh, you had them because the, because that color, that teal color. Yes. Pops. Right. Let me see. So I had the shoes. Yeah. I wore them once. They were in great <laughs> condition because they didn't fit me because I, and I only wore them once, but I couldn't like give the shoe. I don't know. I couldn't part with the shoes. So I kept the shoes, yeah. even though they couldn't, they weren't comfortable. Um, <laughs> and so I was like, I want to use these shoes because I love the color. And yeah. was thinking about, you know, what color I could pair with these shoes and was like, oh, I love blue and yellow together. It's just like one of my favorite color combinations. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, what kind of yellow would look good with these shoes? And I was like, oh, like kind of like a bright sun color or an egg color. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, good. We've got the teal shoes. I'm thinking of an egg yolk what would make sense? And I was like, oh, walking on eggshells. Just <laughs> kind of that phrase came to mind. And then came the fun part of trying to figure out how to actually execute this image. And then some people, you know, are surprised that these are actual eggs. So I bought a ton. No kidding. <laughs> a ton of eggs and, you know, had to figure out how can I, you know, place these eggs so I can actually sit the shoes on top and ended up cracking a gazillion eggs. Oh my gosh. And trying to get them, you know, exactly in half. And then some worked really well, others not so much, and just kind of went from there experimenting with cracking these eggs and removing the egg yolk, making it happen and kind of having it all come together. Yeah. Oh, I, but I, it's, it's, it's all those things of kind of what you spoke about though, from a style perspective of it's, yeah. It's the minimalist, but with a lot of intention. Yes. Um, and you're right, those colors, it's like that combination of that little yellow peeking out from the toe and that, you know, that that kind of diagonal swoosh across the scene. I just, it's, mm -hmm. it jumped out at me when I was looking at the portfolio. I was like, oh, we got to talk about this one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, yes. And it was, it was a great moment for me too, because it helped me to troubleshoot in the moment because there were many, many things that I had to kind of troubleshoot about that image. One, making sure that it looked like the shoes were actually on top of the eggshell. So having to kind of tuck some of the eggshells underneath the shoe and, and prop the shoes up. So there are erasers that you can't see that are in that shot. There's like a CD that's in the shot and having to slide the egg yolk in and not crack the egg yolk as I'm trying to place it. So I placed all the eggshells first and then kind of slid the eggshell in and mm -hmm. having to use plexiglass. So I'm like, oh, I can't put the egg yolk directly on, you know, my white, you know, foam core because it's going to stain it. It's going to seep through. It's, you know, it's not going to work. So what can I do? Oh, let me buy, you know, some clear plexiglass put the egg yolk on that, slide it in. And so, you know, I really had to think through that image and I styled it across several days as I kept, you know, experimenting and trying to figure out like, how can I make this work? And yeah. then of course, lighting it and everything else, but. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It is quite a, you know, sometimes the simplest images in some ways are like the hardest to execute. Yes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's awesome. It's so fun to hear that process. And I'm sure Tether Tools absolutely loved it. Yes. You know, it received good feedback. So I was happy with that. Yeah. And talk about a badge of honor. I mean, I, I want to go back to what you had said 
that I feel like so like something that's so important as a photographer is to take those opportunities when you're scared yes. and to move forward anyway. I mean, how has that helped move you forward in your, in your career? Yes. I mean, tremendously, because there have been several opportunities that I've taken on that, you know, had I not done that, I wouldn't have progressed and grown and thought of new ideas. You know, there was a moment when I was shooting for, you know, a pretty well-known subscription box, natural hair care subscription box. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I accepted that opportunity and then thought, oh my goodness, how am I going to keep coming up with new ideas, mm -hmm. you know, for each box? And I was shooting like three and four boxes a month sometimes. Wow. And it really pushes you to think of new ideas and to have confidence in yourself that, you know what, I'm not going to run out of ideas. You know, you kind of just have to keep finding sources of inspiration and keep going. And there was another moment where I had um, an opportunity to shoot, this is unrelated to flat lays or food, but a large company contacted me to photograph the Atlanta skyline. And I was like, there are tons of images of this particular shot from this very vantage point that I'm like, why don't they just buy an image? <laughs> like, why are they asking me? But it was like a super huge company that asked me to do this and offering to pay, you know, thousands of dollars for one image. And so it's like, yes, I, I will do that. Yeah. And then they came back and said like, Hey, and it's so funny because I was trying to photograph this, you know, skyline without many cars in the scene. Okay. And then they came back and were saying like, hey, can you add more cars to the road? And I'm like, you're kidding me. You're kidding me <laughs> right now. I would have done that had I known you wanted more cars on the road. I'm trying to wait for moments and I Photoshop. For sure. Cars totally. Like, cars on the road. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, and then they're like, oh yeah. And can you remove the lamppost? And in that image, there were buildings with tons and tons of windows that this lamppost was going through yeah I was like oh my goodness and they were like oh so can you can you do that can you add more cars to the road can you remove these lampposts and I was like sure I sh yes and they're like and what would your you know retouching fee be for that and so I made up a number I'm like googling like okay what should I charge for retouching and you know thankfully I had taken a lot of different images while I was out there trying to not get cars in the scene and like different vantage points I was able to cut and paste from different ones because oh. I wasn't sure that I could do it. I was like, my retouching skills are okay, but I'm not a retoucher, you know? Yeah. So it's just really taking those opportunities lets you like dig deep in terms of what you can really accomplish and what skills you have that you don't even realize you have as long as you, you know, just kind of try it and see, and you're surprised yourself, I think. Yeah. Doesn't make it any less scary. No, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. But you continue to show up and it's amazing to see where it'll take you. Yes. Um, so let's see. Oh, we're getting close to the end of our time together. Oh, so uh, is now as far as, um, your potential clients. So, and the clients that you work with, I mean, obviously mm -hmm. you've mentioned folks you've worked with over the years and, um, you know, your, your specialty really being in that flat lay uh, yeah. and product photography, the interiors. And so when you've got, you know, I think there's probably a lot of folks here on the call who are getting started in that process of starting to take clients and starting to navigate this space. And, you know, I think for somebody like you, who's got, you know, you, you're a busy person, uh, you've got family life, you've got this job and this business and all these different things that you have to be choosy when it comes to um, clients. You yeah. can't just take every person who shows up on your doorstep. And so for you in picking clients and being strategic about that, are there red flags or are there things that you specifically pay attention to when you're talking to a potential client that kind of will tell you whether or not they're going to be a good fit for you? Yes, I think um, one, getting a sense of the types of images that they want me to create, because sometimes people will approach me to one, create some styled images, but then they'll say, oh, and we also want some images on white. And I say like, oh, yes, I'm, I'm not the right person for you because I don't shoot on white. I can, I don't enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so if I know that I'm not going to enjoy the work, then, you know, I pleasantly decline that and, and <laughs> refer another photographer. Like I have a group of people 
other photographers that I have kind of on the side that I'll refer work to. And so I'm like, that's not a good fit for me because, you know, it's kind of a snooze fest to be honest for me to shoot on weight. I don't enjoy doing it. Yeah. So I don't. And then I think also I want clients who have a clear sense of their branding and their target audience. And so sometimes folks will come to me, especially if they're a new company and they're getting ready to launch a new product. And I'll ask about, you know, like, oh, what's your brand? And they say, oh, we're getting a logo made. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not talking about your logo. I'm talking about, you know, your kind of larger brand. Do you have a brand brief that you can send? Maybe you're working with, you know, a branding specialist, for example, because Mm -hmm. it's, I don't know, I'm like, it kind of hurts my heart (laughs) when folks approach me to create images and I can create beautiful images that, you know, coordinate with your product and the colors will work together and placement and everything like that. And then a few months later, maybe when you are able to really focus on your branding, you realize that those images don't fit your branding. And so now you need me to create a new set of images and it's kind of a waste of money and I don't want you to waste your money. Yeah. So there's that. And then I think the third piece is that I really want, you know, clients who truly want to collaborate. So Mm -hmm. yes, it's great if they come with ideas, but that they also want to hear my ideas and kind of trust me to create images that they love. So if they're too heavy handed and I feel like they just totally want to direct the shoot, Mm -hmm. that's kind of a red flag for me because sometimes what people think they want when they see it, it's like, Mm -hmm. oh, that's not what I want. It's like, well, that's what you said. (laughs) Like you, you know, and they don't want to hear your input and, and you're coming to me because you think that I'm an expert in this particular type of photography. So like, trust me with it. Yeah. And yeah. So, and you can get a sense of that when you're having those initial conversations. You can. With somebody. You can. It's really you know, interesting. If you ask the right questions and if you're really listening. And I think for me, it was a matter of like not being afraid to say no. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it's like, oh, but this is a good job. And I think that the payout will be really great in terms of, you know, the income that will come in. But it's like, okay, at what cost? And at some point you say no to this and another opportunity, perhaps an even better one you know, will come along. And so I think that you just have to really stay true to what you truly enjoy, what works best for you and your business model, et cetera. And, and also just for your peace of mind, really. Yeah. And so I think that, yeah, one of the things that I think strikes me about the way you do your work and run your business is that you do have a a sense of who you are and what's important to you and what you value and taking that intentional time to evaluate those things. um, So that then when those opportunities do come that you have a real clear sense of, yes, this is in line with what I do. No, this is not, you know, somebody somebody comes to you for a wedding, you like your wedding sounds great. Here's another (laughs) photographer. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And I think that it also comes with showing and you know people have said this all the time but I I just think it's really true showing the work that you want to shoot so people aren't coming to you that often hopefully with work that's not in line at least visually with the type of work that you enjoy doing and I do other things but I don't show those other things you know because I'm like "Eh, you know I can do it but that's not really what I want to be known for and that's not the type of work that I'm necessarily trying to attract. Yeah so be clear on your portfolio page with what it is that you're trying to do. I love it. So one of the things that uh, I have to highly recommend to everybody out there, because obviously over the years and over time, you've really developed incredible strategies for flat lay photography. So those overhead shots and, you know, the technical that goes into that from lighting to gear, all the things, the compositions, everything that you need to know. And so you've put together some really uh, cool resources. And I've got links down below your toolkit, which there are so many gems in this toolkit of things that like when I downloaded it, I was like, you know, I never thought of that. That's a great little piece of gear right there. So can you share with everybody just a little bit about, um, the toolkit is a free download that is linked down in the description box below. So go grab that, but can you kind of just tell everybody like high level overview of what's in that toolkit? Yes. So high level overview. It's, it's a toolkit of the favorite kind of items that I use to create all of my flat lay images. And so there are kind of low ticket items, inexpensive, like my leveling cube, which I use all the time. The very first thing that I put on my camera when I'm about to take a flat lay photograph 
to higher end items that are, you know, maybe lighting or camera or gear or, you know, my C stand that's behind me in this <laughs> video. Yep, yep. <laughs> a mid range item, I guess. And so it has everything that you could ever need or want to photograph a flat lay image, you know, at different price points as well. Yeah, that's awesome. And then two, for those who want to dig even deeper, they're like, okay, I'm, you know, I want to do this kind of real focus, especially in the styled product photography, you yeah. have the flat lay plate course, which I have gone through, learned so much, enjoyed it. It was so beautifully done. Um, so that, that course is also available. You can definitely go check it out. It's linked as well down below. So once you download the toolkit, you'll have all the info, um, for the course. And is that, that's just open whenever it is, it is, you can join today, join today, get in there, enjoy the process with Kimberly. Cause that's, that's the other fun thing that, and why I love, um, conversations like this is that, you know, when you work with somebody who is so specifically keyed in to one very particular thing, like, you know, I know enough about flat lay to be dangerous, but then taking your course and seeing, oh, this is somebody who lives and breathes this right. all the time. Um, it's really, it's so much fun to, to experience and to learn from. So thank you for creating those resources for oh, all of you're, us. You're welcome. And I wanted to create them too, because when I was starting out, there were no resources available. And it seemed as if, you know, people are afraid to show you how they do it because they don't want, you know, the competition. But I'm like, it's your own style that you're putting on it that differentiates you from other people, not necessarily the nuts and bolts of where you're placing items. You need to learn that so then you can then put your own style on it and kind of make a path for yourself. So I wanted to give people those skills like, yeah, come along with me, yeah. you know, have a lane right next to mine where you're creating beautiful images. I'm creating beautiful images. And you're able to do that if you kind of have the foundation and know the composition knowledge and stuff. Yeah. And you're going to get everybody obsessed with knolling. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Kimberly, so. hashtag Kimberly's knolling. Like it's like a, I don't know. It's like a thing at this point, but I was like, <laughs> there's some great resources. If you don't know about knolling, hang yeah. out with Kimberly for a hot minute and you'll, you'll figure it all out. Yeah. But um, we've got about 10 minutes left for some Q and a, if that works for you, Kimberly. Definitely. I love it. All right. Um, let's see who is, Oh, the crafter you had mentioned about um, yes. that you worked with for a year. Paper and stitch. Brittany paper, Melhoff. Paper yeah. and stitch. Yes. Author. Brittany Melhoff. Awesome. Yeah. She moved, um, she's since moved from Atlanta. She's now in California. She moved okay. it there. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Um, LVS Custom Creations. Oh, okay. Lots of people want to know who that crafter was. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Kim Morris wants to know a question for Kimberly. Yeah. Um, you have so many great colorful backgrounds. Do you really? make them? Do you buy them? Um, or use white and change the color in Photoshop? No to the latter. So I purchased them. Some Most are paper if they look smooth. And then I also have some backdrops that I purchased. So my paper is from Color Aid, which is fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. And then I have kind of harder surface surfaces that I purchased. And then some that I've made as well. So I kind of run the gamut of, you know, nice purchase match. and kind of DIY. Yeah. Yeah. Because the paper too, I mean, Color Aid's great stuff. You know, that's like art quality paper. Yes. Um, but you probably got to be careful not to spill on it. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So you have to be careful not to spill on it um, and or even put things on it that are oily. So I did a shot with um, it's like the, on the purple backdrop and it has uh, these like tarts, these tart shells. And those are oily because they were butter tarts. And so it'll leave a stain. And I will say as much as I love them and I, and I continuously buy colory paper, they scratch easily. So be careful, like don't drag things across that paper. You kind of need to lift, lift things up because yeah. they do scratch really easily, but I love how pigmented they are. So yeah, yeah. you get that super matte texture you do. sort of effect. Yes. Great question. Um, Carmen Sneed wants to know, um, uh, let's see, is your experience as online Instagram been as or more successful or more rewarding than in-person or more local clients? So I'm thinking, I'm going to read between the lines here. Okay. I'm thinking what we're looking for is 
Um, I guess, do you work with clients remotely or are you doing more of the in-person? What does that look like for you? So it's all remotely. So my clients mail me the products if they're not local. And then I photograph it, send the products back if they want the products back or keep the products if they don't want the products back. And so it's all remote. That's awesome. So, but so I mean, once COVID hit, that really wasn't a shift for you in terms of the way you did business. Not at all. And it was so interesting because once COVID hit, I actually had a ton of inquiries from different businesses who wanted product photography. And I was like, oh my goodness. And, mm -hmm. and, and at that time, I was also trying to kind of downsize a little bit in terms of my client work because, you know, my kids were at home and I was like, I just have a lot going on. Yeah. And so, yeah. So it was an interesting time. And, and thankfully I was able to actually refer one of my um, primary clients to somebody else. I was like, oh, I can't continue to do this work at the volume. It was that um, subscription box service, Curlbox. Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, but I have a student who was in my in-person class at this workshop, you know, at this conference, and she took my flat lay play course. I'm going to refer her to this, you know, main client. I trust that she's going to do a fabulous job and she's working with them and, and is killing it. That's so, awesome. you know, I think if they're able to make these connections, then, you know, you can kind of continue in that path. Oh yeah. yeah, absolutely. And uh, oh. you know, we, something actually Ty and I were live yesterday and talked about is the importance of networking with other photographers and right. collaborating with other photographers. Yeah. Cause yeah, I mean, at a certain point, like you're not going to be able to take every gig that comes your right. way. So having good people you're connected with, or if you're just starting your business, right. Being on the receiving end of that. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and I will say just one other thing to add that yeah. working remotely, I think is great too, especially if you kind of have other things going on in your life. You and I talked about this, like I have a full-time job as well as my business. I have two kids. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not always able to do work during the day. So I can do things at night, learn studio lighting. In the very beginning, I was strictly 100% natural light mm -hmm. until I had my my second baby actually okay because his room which got fabulous light you know natural light I was like oh now he needs his own room let me move to my you know my office space and I need to learn how to do studio lighting and so now all of my images are like 100% studio lighting yeah and so with working remotely I think it's great because you can do it kind of on your own time as well. Oh, it's all about that. You yeah. and I are very similar in that way. <laughs> life with kids and life that's unpredictable. It's so nice to have that, that flexibility. So Definitely. I love it. Um, let's see. We've got lots of questions. Um, let's see. Media Smiths LLC arrived a bit late. Um, being a person of color myself, I wonder, I'm wondering how you overcame address the challenges of being a black woman in this industry. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's been, I feel like it's been a challenge internally for one. So, and not really knowing if I would get certain opportunities because I was a black woman, you know? And there was a long period of time when I didn't show my face on Instagram because I was like, oh, if people know that I'm black, they're not going to book me. Mm -hmm. I want them to just book me on the strength of my work. And then maybe they'll go to my website and look at my about page and, and say, oh, you know, wow. And so I think internally it's affected me. And I don't know if it's more so than in reality or not, because you'll never know if somebody didn't select you because you're a black woman. Mm -hmm. um, and then I will say that I also on the opposite side, you know, kind of struggled after, you know, there was this whole period of like amplify melanated voices after, you know, all of the police brutality that's been going on. Mm -hmm. And a number of opportunities have been presented since then. And it's hard to kind of weed through that and ask myself, like, to what extent are these, you know, folks reaching out to me because I'm a black woman and I check the box and they can show that they're being supportive. And to what extent are they really just interested in my work and the quality of the work that I can bring and the ideas that I can bring to the table? And it's still something that I question and I go back and forth and should I say yes to this and let me look to see what their history has been. And, you know, it's a struggle to be, to be quite frank and open about it. Yeah, no, I, yeah. 
Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, Thanks for the question too. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, along those same, well, not not along the same lines. Okay. The same person wants yes. to know: Can you share a little bit about how you approach licensing your images to a client, um, and what kind of terms are key for you? Yes. So I to be, and I'll let you also weigh in if you want to add to it, Jenny. Yeah. So for me, I build in licensing with my pricing and have a set period of time. And so it's like they're licensed for three years. Typically I include it in the pricing. I typically work with um, smaller businesses for like a large company and especially the large, you know, Skyline that I mentioned, they had a contract that had terms. I reviewed it, agreed to those terms. Um, and I spell it out in my contract, the exact terms, for example, I don't want you re-editing the images. You can't sell the images to a third party. If I created this for you, I don't want to now see it sold on some stock site. <laughs> you know, so you have to be very clear because sometimes people think that they can do whatever they want with the images because they purchased the image. It's like, yes, however, you know, I own the copyright to that image and they need to understand what that means. And I don't think that folks are always knowledgeable about what that even means. And even in terms of sharing that image with a the magazine, they're excited if a magazine wants to approach them and be featured in the magazine. So they're going to start sharing all these images that you know they think that they paid for and can do what they want. And like, yes, no, <laughs> you know, at the you know because sometimes I'm surprised, and I might just happen to be on Instagram and see a client, you know, say like, oh, I'm featured in this magazine. I'm like, yeah, that's an image I took. I had no idea that you were even submitting it to this company. So yeah. you have to be just very clear and spell things out in your contract, which I learned over time. Yep. Yep. No, definitely. Yeah. 100%. And I think there's a lot of ways, depending on the kinds of clients that you're serving, how you can right. slice and dice that licensing, you know, when we're doing a recommendation that I provide a lot is when you're working, um, maybe directly with a company who's not as savvy about the licensing pricing and things like that we're yeah. building that into the photography fee so that it's all kind of a part of the same package as opposed to working with like an advertising agency who wants mm -hmm. to see the very specific like understands what licensing means right. understanding what usage means and so breaking that out separately so depending on the particular client that you're working with um, there's lots of ways to to slice and dice that so yes and there are resources online as well like pricing calculators and some people will go to a you know certain stock photography sites the well-known ones mm -hmm. and get a sense of what they charge to license particular images at different sizes to kind of give you you know a sense of a ballpark that you might want to aim yeah. if you do decide to not build it all in or if you do build it yeah. on one price yeah definitely like uh carl carl taylor um, in the food photography summit that we were a part of a number of weeks yeah. ago, <laughs> he said it's a dark art, <laughs> the dark art of image licensing. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more, but yeah, there's definitely some good, good standards out there. Well, I, we're coming to the end of our time, 8.59 a.m. on the button, um, but I just wanted to take again this opportunity to say thank you so much to you for um, being generous with your time and knowledge this morning and sharing with all of us um, your, your expertise and your journey. I know it's been exciting for me and encouraging to uh, me and I'm sure other people who are on the call as well. Um, and they got a lot out of this. So um, where we can follow you, of course, we've got the good old Instagram. Indeed. So that is linked down below. What is the actual handle though? Cause I'm not remembering it off the top of my head. It's at K Murray photo. K Murray photo. So be Thank sure you. to go follow Kimberly, go yes. show her some love and some thumbs up. Um, <laughs> and uh, check out the flat lay toolkit, which is also linked below as well as her flat lay lay course. I can't recommend it enough. Thank so, you. Uh, with that, thank you so much, Kimberly. Thank you to everybody who joined us today for sharing uh, your time with us. And we'll see you again soon, okay? Yes, Bye, everybody. Thanks, Jenny.